Well, thank you for joining us um, and sit back and relax and enjoy. I'm going to talk all about mums. So mums are really the sign of fall for me. So when, when the mums start to show up here at the garden center or when they start to pop back out of your ground, um, then it's really kind of the sign or I shouldn't say pop out of the ground because those pop out in the spring. But when they, they really start to bloom and show their colors, it's really that, that, that color of fall because you get so many different colors in there. You get the whites, you get maroons, oranges, yellows. They're so much fun and they're so easy. And so mums are one of my favorite things to use in the fall. And you can use them in so many different ways. And we're going to go, I'm going to talk about all the different ways you can use them um, as we go through this webinar. But you can use them on your front porch. Super, super easy on the front porch. I love them in a clay pot. You know, just stick it in a clay pot. You can plant it in a clay pot. You can put it in a mixed container with different things like grasses and crotons. Uh, there's lots and lots of different things. I'm going to show you some of the plants that you can pair them with. You can use them in your landscape. They're great landscape plants. Uh, really was one of the probably the most sought after perennials for many, many years uh, because of how reliable it is about coming back. So there's lots and lots of great uses. You can even use it inside your home. Florist mums are becoming very, very popular uh, because you can grow them inside and you can bring them inside. Now, a lot of us might throw them away and that's perfectly fine too. Put them in your compost pile. That's what I recommend doing is just throw them in a compost pile at the end of the season. If you don't want to grow them in your landscape, you don't want to regrow them. What I also like to do, I'll give you a couple tips here, uh, is I'll cut them back and I'll use the root system uh, for winter decorating. I'll talk about that here in a little bit. So. Uh, I just want to say hello to Sharon, good morning, and Jane uh, from Portsmouth. Awesome. So, uh, so mums are one of my favorite things to use in the fall season, and they just add so much color. You know, they just burst into color. I mean, here, I'll just show you this yellow one here. You know, that's what they look like, just solid, you know, full color. Think of like the azaleas in the spring. This is kind of what mums do in the fall, is they're just full of, full of color, and they're so easy to grow, and I'm going to talk about all the ways that you can grow them. The first thing I want to talk about is, are they perennial or annual? A lot of people treat them as annuals, and like I mentioned, that's perfectly fine, but they are actually perennials, and perennials will come back each year. So that's the difference between annuals and perennials. Perennials, you know, come back year after year, and then annuals, you're planting annually. So that's kind of, you know, a weird play on words there. I think a lot of people think annuals, they come back annually. Annual is you plant annuals you plant annually. So think of like pansies as we get into the fall. And then in the spring, you're going to rip out your pansies. You're going to put in petunias and, and um, uh, begonias and all those different types of million bells and everything that you can do in the spring. There's a whole lot more options in the spring than there are in the fall. The fall, it's really pansies and snapdragons and, of course, mums. And mums are a great option as an annual. However, they are perennials. So if you want to plant them in the landscape, they're great perennial plants. Um, they're very easy to grow and you don't, don't require a whole lot of care. I'll talk about the little things that you can do here and there to get a very, very nice mum, but you almost really don't even have to do any of them if you want to just let them grow naturally. Um, so mums are very, very easy. Now, what we kind of do here at the garden center is we distinguish between hardy mums or garden mums and florist mums. And that's kind of the major difference there is what, what, what are those two? Uh, your garden mums or your hardy mums are going to be hardy from zones five to nine. Typically, you might find some that are hardy to zone four, uh, but typically zone five to nine, which is right here. I mean, we're zone seven, eight, kind of in that mix, depending on where you are on the peninsula down to the beach. Um, but seven to eight is our zone, and that means we're going to be perfectly fine with garden mums. Garden mums are hardy, they're easy to grow. Now, what's the difference between mums and asters? That's a question we get a lot as well. And asters are slightly different. So here's an aster. Uh, well, I shouldn't say they're different, and you're not going to really be able to see the difference here. Here's an aster. It's a little bit of a softer bloom, or it's a little bit of a uh, uh, less full bloom. So it's got more of that pollen kind of stamen center, uh, a little bit of a more of a single bloom. And you're typically going to get asters in the colors of blues, whites, purples, those kind of softer uh, shades, pinks, a little bit of soft pinks in there, uh, lots and lots of shades of purple to almost that blue color. But asters are really sought after by our pollinator gardens, uh, by, by the people that want to you know, support the butterflies and the bees. Uh, great in perennials. Uh, and asters are actually native to uh, the North America area. So uh, asters are fairly native. And of course, uh, native var is kind of the new thing. Uh, native var meaning that there's varieties or variegations uh, from our native species. 
Um, and that's what we carry is a lot of different types of asters. Now, asters kind of come and go. They're real short-lived. We have some now. If you want asters, they're great for the landscape. But really, mums are asters too. So asters are the larger genus, the larger family. And mums are off of those. And so mums are really kind of hybridized from the... Uh, from China and Japan, those are kind of the areas that they really come from. And that's where we start to kind of mix and get some different hybrids. And what they've done is they've grown them for the best uh, blooming and the most compact size. And that's really what you want out of a garden mum. And what also it happens is you get the hardiness too. So you get the ability to uh, not worry about um, you know how hardy they're going to be. You know you know you're going to have uh, you're going to be successful with them as long as you're in zones five to nine. I see Wendy says uh, Southwest Virginia is zone six. Yep. So you're going to be perfectly fine with mums in, in zone six. They're really hardy from five to nine. Virginia has a lot of different zones in it because we've got you know up in the mountains. Southwest Virginia, uh, you're going to get a little bit colder, obviously, in the winter than we do here closer to the ocean. Um, so, and then we've got Diane. Hello. Just want to say hello to everybody as they come in. Um, so, mums are awesome. And so that's kind of, you know, the, the scientific side of it. Asters. So really all mums are asters, but not all asters are mums. So it's kind of, you know, a, a, a funny thing there. Asters are great for, uh, like I mentioned, those perennial gardens, those, those beekeepers. It's a late kind of uh, source of food for the butterflies, uh, whether they're swallowtails that live in our area or the monarchs that are migrating back south. Gives them a little bit of, of substance as they kind of head back down. Um, and it's a great fall blooming plant. You know, a lot of people that, that have pollinator gardens are looking for something that's going to bloom in the fall. And so you've got your fall blooming azaleas, you've got your fall blooming camellias, and then asters, goldenrod. There's a lot of different ones out there. I'm not going to get into all of the pollinator stuff. But mums also provide a little source of, of nectar as well. And mums are awesome because they just provide so much color. Um, so in the mums, let me show you the difference between... I've got, I grabbed a florist mum. We don't have a huge selection of these. Typically, we'll get more of these as we get later into the month of September and October. But florist mums are typically going to be a little bit different. So you're going to get like your football mums, um, quilled mums, uh, pom poms, lots and lots of different shapes and sizes and lots of different colors. Some of these will be hardy. Some of them won't. And a lot of times, the growers don't really uh, let you know if they're going to be hardy or not. So what I like to say is, if you want to try and grow them as a hardy perennial, then plant them outside, see what happens, see if they come back. But you can see this one that I grabbed has that really, you can't quite see it, but it's almost like a purple center in there. So almost very, very daisy-like, whereas if you compare it to a regular garden mom, they're a little bit fuller. So these are more kind of designed uh, to be hardy, and then your florist mums, you get lots and lots of different ones. Uh, some that will actually change colors as they continue to go, and you can get lots and lots of different shapes and sizes out of them as well. Um, but typically, growers aren't going to tell you if they're a hardy mum or not, or if they're, what zones they're going to grow in. So you're going to have to kind of do that by trial and error. And sometimes you'll get a slightly different bloom look when you plant them outside and they come back, if they do come back each year. Um, so, so florist mums and garden mums are slightly different. We distinguish those here in the garden center. So if you ever see a sign saying florist mums, typically we're going to carry our florist mums in our houseplant section, whereas your garden mums are going to be out in the sun, out in the perennials or annual section uh, because they're just easy for color. So that's really the difference between those two. So if you're looking for mums, lots and lots of different choices. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the difference between asters and mums is a, is a big one. Uh, so now let's talk about growing mums. Growing mums is very, very easy, and there's so many different uses. I'm going to talk about all the decorating kind of tips that you can use for mums uh, here in a minute. But I really kind of want to go through just a couple, you know, fine points of, of how to grow mums successfully in your yard or in containers. So, of course, the first easy way is let's say you're just changing out some color in a container. Maybe your petunia is kind of fizzled out, your million bells are kind of done for the season, and you just need to pop a color. Uh, you know, grabbing a mum in a six inch pot like this is going to be a great little show of color. Planting in that planter, you know, you can rip out that petunia or something, make a little bit of a hole, stick in your mum, and you're ready to go for at least a month and a half, two months. And so that's what's so good about mums is you can use them that way as an annual. Um, and then, of course, you can do lots and lots of different things with them, too. And I'm, like I mentioned, I'm going to talk about the decorating tips here in a second. But if we want to grow them as a perennial, because perennials are great. So if you're not thinking about chunking them, if you're not going to put them in the, in the compost pile, um, then you might want to plant them around the yard. I mean, it's a great thing to do. Pop 
pop them up on your front porch, enjoy the fall color and the fall show, uh, pair them with pumpkins and lots of different things, and then plant them somewhere in the yard. It can be in the front yard or the backyard. Now mums, when they're planted, are going to um, actually uh, pop up in the spring season, so probably around April is when you typically are going to see them coming out of the ground. Uh, we don't have a frost until about April 15th, depending on where you live. Of course, Southwest uh, Virginia, you might see them coming out of the soil a little bit later, but they're just going to come up and start growing. Um, and so they're very, very easy, very reliable. And from here on, you don't really have to do anything to them. A little bit of plant food would go a long way. And what I would recommend there is any of the organic um, any of the organic fertilizer, I was wondering if I grabbed any fertilizer, I did. Um, so plant foods, any of the organic Espoma plant foods are going to be great for mums. But we also have our McDonald green leaf. So this is our organic and our traditional formula. And these are great because they're going to provide sources of food, uh, trace elements, smaller things that uh, all plants need in this area. And so typically when you get some of those bigger uh, uh, plant food names like Espoma, miracle Grow, those types of things, they're going to have your macronutrients, but the trace elements are super, super important. Boron, copper, zinc, molybdenum. So if you're looking for a good all-purpose plant food, then our green leaf are some of the best. They're going to pop up out of the spring, uh, pop out of the soil in the spring, and typically they're going to get, you know, probably about, you know, eight to ten inches fairly quickly, depending on the size of what you planted them on. So we've got, of course, lots and lots of different sizes. You've got your six inch, got your nine inch, and then we'll carry ten and twelve inch as we get a little bit later in the, uh, probably this week we'll get more ten and twelve inch in. Um, so you can get lots and lots of different sizes of them. Typically in the landscape, most mums are going to get somewhere in the range of about a foot and a half to two feet tall and about two to three feet wide. So let's say two by two, two by three is typically what we're going to say for a mum in the landscape. And then you definitely want to plant them in full sun. So they're going to love full sun. Uh, if you get them in a little bit of shade, you might end up with some issues with powdery mildew, uh, maybe a little bit of leaf spot, some bacterial leaf spot. Uh, that can be easily treated. I did grab my bottle of triple action. So triple action is a great thing to have around. Uh, this is kind of a funny one because triple action is organic. It's got neem oil and, and pyrethrin. And pyrethrin sounds kind of chemically, doesn't it? Kind of like a traditional solution, but pyrethrin is actually a form of chrysanthemum oil. So you can actually treat mums and asters with mum oil. So chrysanthemum oil is where they, we get pyrethrin from and it's a natural insecticide. So triple action is an insecticide, fungicide, and miticide. It does all three things. It's really one of my go-to kind of preventative methods. So if I've got a mum that's maybe planting a little bit of shade, I've had powdery mildew in the past, so in the spring when it emerges, I'll usually give it a little dose of triple action and keep up with that about once every month uh, just to kind of prevent any insect or disease issues. So it's great preventative. It does have some curative qualities as well, but it's a really, really good preventative. And I always say better to be preventative than curative. So this is one that I always have laying around my house, um, in my shed, in my garage, so that I can always quickly grab it and use it. Triple action is a great one uh, to use on mums early in the season and then throughout the season because they can get other issues. Uh, they can get um, uh, you know some of the mealy bugs and uh, thrips and uh, what's the other one that I'm trying to think of? Uh, leaf miners. Leaf miners is a big one. So, so this is a great way to kind of prevent most of those. Um, I see a question from Sharon. Do mums grow well in hanging baskets for the northeast part of the yard? Uh, yeah, the, you know, especially if you're, and that's the other kind of thing here when we're talking about mums just using them to decorate. They do fine when they're blooming, when they start to bloom, we're really talking about the growing season or, or if we're growing them in the landscape where we would plant them. But if you're using them in a northeast area where you're probably only going to get a little bit of morning sun, you're going to be perfectly fine. So mums will bloom in a uh, shorter daylight season. So that's what happens is they start to grow in the spring, they come up out of the ground, or for growers or for us growing them in a container, they'll pop up out of the ground. And then um, as the, the summer goes, they get bigger and bigger, and then they start to produce buds as we get into the midsummer time frame. Then as those days get shorter, that kind of signifies to the mom, okay, it's time to bloom. So when they go into the blooming mode, it's really not going to you know, change anything whether they're in shade or sun. Um, typically, you actually might get a little bit of a longer bloom season in a container in a little bit of shade, especially if you got a little protection too. From the, uh, from the wind and the rain. So that can kind of start to kind of dampen uh, you know, your blooms on them a little bit. Uh, but, 
But great question, and yes, they work very well. Once they're kind of in their bloom mode, that's kind of what they're gonna do um, all the way through the fall season, and then they'll finish up. When you use them in the landscape, you definitely wanna plant them in full sun and give them a moist, well-drained soil. That's kind of one of the most important things, I think, for moms. Moms have a very strong root system. They're very heavy feeders. They're very, very good, durable plants, and because they have a strong, aggressive root system, that means that they need some good soil, and they need a little bit of attention, and so what we can do is use those plant foods, like I mentioned, the green leaf is a great one, but give them a moist, well-drained soil, and so what we want to do in our area, in the Virginia area in general, but really across the country, is amend your soil. So add some good nutrients, in with a compost and then I always like to use perlite because that helps for drainage purposes. So amend your soil, one part your soil, one part compost, one part perlite. So that's a third of each. Use that to amend your soil and then backfill with that. And that's a great way to plant really any plant, uh, especially here in the state of Virginia. Uh, especially if you have clay soil. Now, if you got sandy soil, we might omit the compost and put peat in instead, uh, but typically we're gonna recommend compost and perlite. Uh, it's a great option uh, to kind of really kind of amend your soil and have a great growing soil. If you ever look at a tag, it's one of my favorite things. Uh, whenever I look at a tag, it says moist, well-drained soil. Every plant says that. Uh, and of course, what plant wouldn't like moist, well-drained soil? It sounds perfect. And what we're trying to do there is just encourage that environment. But in the full sun area, a garden mom, you will see, you know, can have a very extensive root system. It's a very strong, durable plant, very, very hardy. Uh, so let's go, you know, through the entire season of what we can do. Spring, it's gonna emerge out of the soil, um, out of your mulch beds, wherever you might be growing it, even in a container. A lot of people have success with growing them over and over again in a big pot or something like that. Um, but once they emerge, they're going to start growing. I, I usually give them a little squirt of triple action as soon as they get about six to eight inches tall. And then I will use uh, the plant food, our McDonald green leaf plant food, in about the May 1st time frame. Once we get to May 1st, we know we've passed all of our seasons of frost. So our chances of frost are pretty much past. Might be close to May 1st, maybe even May 10th on uh, Southeast Virginia or Southwest Virginia there. Um, so, so just be careful, know your frost date. Frost dates are super, super important. You can look that up on uh, any of the USDA websites uh, that have all of our zones listings. It'll tell you when your last average frost date is. Here in the uh, southeast part of Virginia, it's typically somewhere between April 10th and April 20th. Uh, so once we're past that, we know we're good to feed. And when you feed, what, what happens is the plant's gonna grow a little bit more aggressively. And, and as I mentioned, mums are heavy feeders. So you wanna make sure that you're giving them enough food. So I usually feed in May. And then what you're gonna do is probably about May 15th is when I start to prune them. And now you don't have to do this. Again, none of this you really probably have to do. Garden mums are super, super hardy and very easy to grow. But a little bit of plant food goes a long way. And pruning really helps form these great plants. So whenever you see like a huge mum like this that is super, super full, I mean super dense, you could almost rest uh, you know, <laughs> a, a small dog on top of this. Uh, it's very, very dense plant. And the reason that is, is because they've been pruned and they've been sheared and cut back. And what that does is encourage uh, more branching. And it keeps it a little bit smaller in size too. So if we re really let a mum just kind of go, it's probably gonna get closer to that two, maybe even two and a half foot size. And then what happens is when it blooms, it kind of falls apart. So if you've ever grown a mum in your yard before, uh, you might notice that is once it blooms, it kind of falls apart. Well, that's because we didn't establish a very strong branch structure. Whenever we prune any plant, uh, every plant kind of grows from a, you know, a straight stem to some degree. And then if you prune that off, it's gonna branch from underneath. And so that's what's gonna happen here with the mum. And if you don't prune it, then one bud will form on each of the end of, of those branches, one bloom. If we prune it, we can get up to five new branches. And then if we prune it again, it just starts to multiply. So five turns into 25. So now we're really getting a nice full plant. And so what the best way for me to describe this to you is try to get three prunes in during a, uh, a time frame from about May 15th to July 15th. So that's about a three month period. If you can just go out once a month and just give it a light shear. Now you can take head shears, you can take scissors, you can take pruners and just give it a light cut back. And so we're talking about taking about an inch, maybe two inches off 
And that'll help establish a stronger branch structure and more blooms when we come into the fall season. Now you'll start to see buds starting to form in that kind of you know late June, July period. Uh, so if you're pruning it in that period, it's perfectly fine. They're gonna reset buds. So if you feel like you know, oh, I shouldn't prune them because they've got buds on them, Again, it's up to you. You don't have to. You can let them ride. Uh, but, and those buds won't open until we start to see shorter daylight. Uh, but you can, um, you can definitely prune them with the buds right on there. They'll come back and they'll regenerate buds. We typically want to stop around the July 15th. You know, I've seen people push it as far as late July, and that's okay. Typically, you're going to get a little bit of a later bloom cycle. Uh, so if that's something that you want, you know, you really want your blooms to kind of be more in the October time frame, then you can give it a little bit of a later prune. You are pushing your luck there a little bit that you have enough time in August. You still need warm weather to produce those blooms. And then what I'll do is I'll, on my last prune, typically around July 15th is what I recommend, then I will give it another little dose of plant food. That gives it enough nutrients to form nice healthy buds and get into that bloom cycle as we get into the September timeframe. Now in containers, you're probably gonna see them bloom a little bit faster. And that's very, very common because soil is gonna warm up a little bit uh, more in a container. So typically they're gonna pop open a little bit faster. Um, you, you might let them dry out too much. We're gonna talk about watering here in a minute. But, but really in containers, you're probably gonna see them bloom just a little bit early. That's just natural. That happens with everything. I mean, you know, it happens with cherry trees. People come in the spring and they want a cherry tree. Ours have pretty much bloomed out by the ones, uh, by the time that people really notice the cherry trees blooming in the area. And that's just because they're above ground, the soil, the root system is gonna warm up a little bit faster and then it's gonna force those blooms off a little bit quicker. Uh, but in the ground, they can last much, much longer um, and usually will bloom a little bit later. So that's why I encourage planting them out in your landscape when you're done, uh, or at least adding them to your compost pile. But that's really as easy as it is. If you plant them in the fall, once you're done with them, uh, and then we'll talk about what you can do in the fall season. So whether you're planting them in the fall or you've grown them for an entire spring, summer season, they've bloomed, they're done. Uh, now you can do a little bit of selective deadheading if you wanted to. Uh, sometimes you'll get another set of blooms on them. It's never gonna be the show-stopping uh, bloom set like this but I'll try and show you. So inside here, let's see if I can open this up. I don't know if you can quite see, but inside here, you're gonna see other little blooms. So I've got probably another, you know, two or three little sets of buds down in there. So again, you're not gonna get that huge bloom set like you are here, but when these are kind of fizzling out and they're starting to kind of turn that brownish color, just go through one day and pick off the deadheads and you'll get a couple sporadic blooms after that. So you can kind of prolong that color uh, with your mums uh, by just doing a little bit of deadheading. Now, asters are slightly different. Asters will continue to bloom throughout the fall season. They never put on quite the, as big of a show as this one it really is doing right now. But what you'll do is most of these buds are opening up, but what I can do is go down and deadhead them a little bit and I can get a little bit more blooms as well. So you can continue to get those blooms throughout the you know, fall season. You just will never get the show that you're gonna get when all of them open up. I mean, and, and by all, I mean a majority of them. So when you really get that big, huge bloom set and then they start to go after that, that's kind of gonna be the end of them. Then I typically move them around back and I'll kind of do a little deadheading on them. Maybe sometimes I'll just take a head shear and just kind of chop off all the dead blooms. See if I get a couple blooms, they're great to pick off and bring and put in little vases or use as decorations for fall inside. Uh, but typically you're gonna get somewhere around a month, month and a half, so six to eight weeks, uh, maybe eight weeks uh, of bloom period. Uh, and it depends on what you're using them for. So again, if, if we're having a party, we got people coming over and I need a big splash of color, then maybe I'm getting one like this. If I'm really growing it or if I'm really getting it to kind of enjoy the whole thing of blooms, then maybe I'm getting one more like this where I've got more buds to open. Um, and of course, Mother Nature plays a huge part of how long they're gonna bloom. Uh, rain is not a huge issue. Typically when we water, we don't want tap water to get our drinking water. So whether it's from a hose bib, uh, wherever you're getting your water source from, try and water down the root system. That can be hard to do because if you're watering the tops, uh, you're gonna kind of fizzle out these blooms a little bit quicker. So try and get down to the root system if you can, get a hose, get a watering can, down straight to the root system so we're just watering the roots. It's always best practice to never water the leaves and always water the root system. All plants take water in through the root system. Very, very few take water in through their leaves. 
Uh, Sharon asks, what's the uh, difference between early bloomers and late bloomers? So the, the, the main difference really is some bloom with a little bit uh, earlier in the season will bloom quicker because they're used to blooming or they've been hybridized to bloom in a, in a, a longer day length time frame. So, so really it's all varieties. If you're looking in, the, in your garden center, what we're gonna get is the early bloomers earlier, we're gonna get the late bloomers later. So that's kind of how you, you know. Typically they're not gonna tell you on the tag and it's very, very hard for us to kind of know either other than to say if you buy one that's like this, that's blooming like this, it's probably gonna be an earlier bloomer. And then if you get one that's a little bit bigger like this that has more buds to it, then it's probably gonna be more of a mid to late season bloomer. Uh, but that's really all it is, 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 is all about daylight and the length of days. So the shorter the day length gets, if they bloom heavier in that period, that means it's a later bloomer. As we, as we start the fall season in September and we've got longer, uh, longer, shorter days. Uh, so as we come out of those summer months and those start to bloom, those are gonna be your earlier bloomers. And really the best way to know is by visiting your garden center, your local garden center a little bit more frequently, and then you'll be able to kind of, be able to kind of plan out your yard a little bit better. So I, I kind of think what you're getting after Sharon, which I think is a great point, is if, um, if I wanna grow mums, you know, and have different color mums in my yard throughout the season, then I would come in every so often and get some, some mums during uh, the, the month of September into early October. And then that way you'll kind of get a really good selection. Because really what garden centers, unless you're a grower, um, but most garden centers are purchasing plants from growers, that's how they're buying them. So, so we're saying, hey, let's, let's get the plants in here while they're blooming so that you can see the color. That is why we really don't carry mums in the spring season, is because they just be a green plant. Um, and so you really wanna know what color they are uh, other than hoping that the tag is correct, which typically they are. Don't wanna say that tags are incorrect, but you really, really never know and you really don't know what the true color is until they bloom. Because, for example, this one is an orange mum, but when you compare it to this yellow one right here, they're almost very, very similar. So, I mean, this one's just got slight orange color in it. So you really wanna see the shades and that's why I recommend getting them in the fall season. I mean, you can even see this guy right here. Who would have known that those little tiny pom-pom blooms would have been on this plant? So this one's called Lime Mum, and it comes out very lime, but it turns to yellow pretty quickly too. So seeing them, I think, is really helpful. You also ask, uh, I love to have mums in the kitchen from September through Thanksgiving. So yeah, so that, Sharon, what I would recommend there, not to say that you can't do a, a, a garden mum indoors, you can. If you wanna do a garden mum indoors, if that's the only mum you can find in your garden center, um, then just give it good, bright, it doesn't have to be direct, but good, bright light indoors, and watch your watering. Watering is gonna be a lot different than it is outside. Outside, we have evaporation, we have wind, we have lots and lots of different things uh, that, that, uh, that attribute to a plant drying out. Indoors, you're not gonna have as much of that. So just watch your watering. Florist mums are gonna be a great option for you, Sharon, inside your home, because uh, you can get them throughout the different periods of the year or throughout the different periods of the fall, and then that way you have different blooms going on throughout the entire fall season. Uh, Wendy says, is it just me or is the feed cutting in? So hopefully it's not. Um, so hopefully, I, I hope it's not just you, but Wendy, if it is you, um, you know, just try restarting or closing down and coming back on. Um, hopefully our connection is still good. So, so that's really all we're gonna do. Now, when the mums kind of start to, 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 to kind of fizzle out as we get closer to the end of the fall season, and really once we have that first frost, so when we get that first frost, which for us is typically around November uh, 15th. So, you know, we're, we're kind of easy. We're April 15th tax day and our first frost is November 15th election day. So, so really kind of easy to remember when, when we're kind of getting close to tax time, then that's when our last frost will happen. And as we get closer to the election periods, when we're doing, when we're voting and stuff, then that is when our first frost is. So we've got easy days to remember. Um, but when uh, we do get that first hard frost, then your mums are gonna go kind of dormant. So they're gonna kind of fizzle off. And in fact, the foliage is gonna turn kind of black if there is any foliage left. Um, and then what we're gonna do is just cut it off to the ground. Now, a lot of people will say to keep that top growth as long as you possibly can. Uh, and that, that's perfectly fine. If you wanna do that, that is perfectly fine. I, I personally don't like the look of it. And in my landscape, I like to go cut them back 
and then mulch over the top. So I just add a nice organic rich layer of mulch. I can either use a purchased bag mulch or you can use leaf um, litter from you know, your neighboring trees um, that maybe you've composted or something that you can just put over straw. Anything that you wanna put over top just really, really helps keep that crown dry. We don't want the crown to rot out. Now, if we're gonna divide mums, dividing mums can happen you know, pretty quickly. Mums can get pretty good size in one year and that's why people love them so much is because you really get a nice big plant very quickly. And that, that's another thing that I forgot to mention is you know, you know, a mum is gonna get somewhere around you know, that two by three size and in the, in the spring and summer seasons, while they're not blooming, they look really nice because they can be very, very perfectly dome shaped. They look like little boxwoods. Uh, you don't have to worry about them too, too much. So they're a pretty plant really year round, um, except in the winter when they're dormant. And so, so really that's all, all we gotta do is just kind of mulch over the top. Now, if we're going to separate them, if we're gonna go kind of split them out, you can let that naturally happen. What'll happen naturally is you'll see kind of a nice dome shaped mum and then one year all of a sudden you'll have kind of another little bubble off to the side. And that's a new plant that basically is formed and you can go in and dig that one out and transplant it. But in the spring season is when you wanna do that. Let the new growth emerge. And usually you'll see around the edge. Now, it's gonna be hard for me to show you here, because most of our mums are pretty young. But for example, I don't know if you can quite see that, but in here, we've got this one little stem all the way out here. That is a kind of a separate stem. You can kind of feel it to the base and it kind of comes out of the soil rather than that main stalk. And that's what you're gonna look for. So when your mums start to emerge in the spring, you start to look around the outer edges and you'll usually see some and you can kind of go in pull them out. Usually what I'll do is I'll go start them in a little pot somewhere. Um, and then once I know that they've kind of established a root system, I can control the watering a little bit better. Then I can go plant them in the yard. Hardy mums are very, very easy to grow. They're very good, aggressive root systems. So typically it's not going to be too long of a time before I'm planting them. Now you can also go just stick them right in the ground. Lots of people are very successful with that. Uh, Lindsay said, I have a garden mum in a container. After a few hot days, I noticed the leaves at the base of the stem start to brown and dry up. Have I underwatered it? So Lindsay, great question. I haven't talked too much about watering other than don't water the tops. But in a container, watering mums, you're gonna probably wanna water pretty much every day, Lindsay, for the first start of spring, or for the first start of fall, because we're still pretty warm here in the September month. Um, so definitely keep them watered. You can also do it by weight. And as I mentioned, they have a very, very aggressive root system. So typically when you take a mum out of its pot, you're gonna see it's nice and full root system. Now this one's actually got a fair amount of soil on it, which is good. It means that I'm not gonna have to water it as much. But if I am worried about that, what I can do is when I plant it or if I put it in, a, in another larger pot, instead of just dropping it in, just add a little bit of potting soil to it. That will really help add uh, a moisture retention uh, a, a space in that soil so that it's not just all root system. Depends on how tight your root ball is. But yes, the brown leaves could be from uh, underwatering. Uh, and typically you're gonna get brown kind of more on the crunchier side. Now, if they're brown and kind of wet, almost maybe blackish, then that could be overwatering. It really just, it could be one or the other. Now, it also could just be natural. Maybe you've got other plants around it. Mums really need pretty good light in order to sustain these green leaves. And you're gonna notice naturally that you're gonna start to get some yellowing on the inside. That is somewhat natural. Um, but could be overwatering, could be underwatering. Most likely underwatering. They're pretty, you know, they're pretty uh, adapt to having a fair amount of water uh, in their root system. Not a problem at all. Typically, overwatering. Really, more it's underwatering. Watch your plants. That's the cool thing about mums too. Is they'll tell you. Some plants don't tell you, but mums do. Uh, the leaves will kind of sag a little bit. Now, if it's six or seven o'clock in the evening, I'm probably not watering. I'm probably pushing it. I always like to water in the morning rather than the evening. But um, if, if, it's, if it's noon, you know, 10 o'clock to, to 2 o'clock, then I see a little bit of sagging in the leaves, then I'm usually going to go out there and give it a little bit of water. Anything in a hanging basket, in a container, uh, in a single pot by itself, in a mixed container, are going to need a little bit more water outside for sure. So hopefully that helps there. And then, and then that's basically it. Now, if we're gonna divide our plants, I, I forgot one other thing, uh, is when we're dividing our, our mums, if we're gonna take the mums off in the spring, the outer edge, you know, we're finding some stems that maybe are shooting out from uh, the, the sides more so than in the center, then um, we, we wanna use a root stimulator to regenerate those roots. So, so what I like to use is Biotone, Espoma's Biotone. Uh, it's a great starter fertilizer, and it also uh, helps with the mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae are 
beneficial bacteria attach themselves to the roots. They form a symbiotic relationship with the plant um, that lasts for really the entirety of the plant. And so in the, that way, you're really, really getting a good root system established much quicker. So Espoma's Biotone Starter Plus, an awesome starter fertilizer with lots and lots of beneficial bacteria and mycorrhizae. So really, really cool thing to use, uh, especially when dividing plants. But when I'm planting anything, I try and use it. Uh, it's very, very easy to use. Uh, and then let's see, do I have anything else along those? So we talked about deadheading, we talked about everything, we talked about how to prune them back. Oh, one other thing that's great about them, for us that live in deer country like myself, is they're deer and rabbit resistant. So that's another great thing about mums, is really nothing really messes with them. Uh, like I mentioned, you might get some powdery mildew, some bacterial leaf spot, those are easy to treat for, be preventative rather than curative with triple action. You might get a couple little insect issues, but that's pretty easy to take care of. And with anything, when they go dormant in the fall season, so late fall, early winter, as you're cutting them off, try and rake up the area, get some of that loose leaf litter out of there, get the branches out of there, um, and that helps kind of relieve it of any kind of fungus that might be hanging around and, and you know, staying in that area. So that helps really kind of clean it out. Um, all right, so now let's talk about some great ways to decorate with mums. They're so, so easy to use. I just want to give you a couple quick kind of simple ideas and we'll wrap it up real quick. Uh, but there's so many, so many different uses for them. Uh, to me, it kind of symbolizes football season. Uh, football season is, is, is fastly approaching. It just started last weekend with, uh, with uh, college football, but mums fall you know, it kind of speaks to me as, as football, and football mums were very, very popular back in the day, and you'll get some of those in the florist mums, those kind of big football-shaped uh, blooms are really, really cool. But uh, what I like to do with them is pair them with a football team that maybe, you know, you know, you got Hokies uh, are real popular in Virginia, UVA. So you've got some colors that you can work with. I mean, there you go. You got your orange and maroon, which is great for the Hokies. I'm personally uh, a JMU uh, Duke graduate, so James Madison University. So I like the purple and yellow, personally. It's a great little mix. So you can make a container pop it next to you know, your little garden flag or maybe your main flag outside, support your local team, support your college teams, your professional teams with colors. I mean, all, pretty much all the colors are available um, other than maybe, you know, some of the, you know, you get blues with the asters, but uh, the Florida Gators, yep. So great, great thing to do, uh, support that. Also, just pairing it with a, you know, just regular garden flag. So I just grabbed this one real quick as I was walking in here. Uh, and this is just a little welcome flag. And so, you know, these great fall colors paired with a nice mom is very, very easy to do. It's a great way to kind of, you know, welcome guests and just kind of dress up your front porch. Add a flag, add, you know, a bird feeder, a bird house, any of those things kind of just to add to a look of it. Uh, I love to pair them with grasses. So I grabbed some grasses here. This is, I think this is a miscanthus, or sorry, it's a pinstamen. This is a Hamlin pinstamen. Of course, that awesome, awesome little plumes. So many different types of plumes out there. Uh, it's great in a container. It adds some height. So whenever we make a container, which I'll do here in the next you know, few upcoming webinars, uh, I'll plant up some fall uh, 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 combo containers. But you know, grass as your thriller, and then your filler as a mum, and then we can put some like Lismachia, Creeping Jenny in there as a spiller you got lots and lots of great options. So some other plants to pair them with are crotons. Crotons are one of my all-time favorites for really, I love crotons because they're tropical, but then they also work right into the fall season. So you can pop these you know, in a container on your front porch in the summer months, um, and they've just got all those oranges and reds and yellows uh, and greens that really are the tropical colors, but then translate right into the fall season. So I love using um, uh, these as a great um, uh, fall kind of color indicated. So I saw Jody said, so where are the blue ones? So blue is really kind of a funny color in nature. I say blue a lot, but really what I'm talking about are different shades of purple. Uh, so you're gonna see a lot of those. Let's see, did I grab one? This one's not a great example. This is an aster that I was gonna show if I wanted to show kind of how to deadhead it but you can, I don't think you can quite see it on camera, but it's really kind of a, a light shade of purple, almost has some bluish tones in it. Blue is a tricky, tricky color in nature. You typically don't see a lot of true blue blooming plants. There's blue days in the summer. Uh, there's some of the plumbagos are blue, uh, but typically you're not gonna get a ton of blue uh, in the flowers. So when I say blue, I'm typically talking about some form or fashion, a shade of purple, uh, whether it's a light lavender to a bluish shade. Uh, and then these are the larger crotons. So let's see, I wanna give you the name of this croton. This is called Mammy, so croton Mammy. 
And this is your Petra, just your normal coat croton. And look at those colors. I mean, you can't beat that for a fall arrangement for fall colors. And you can grow crotons inside. So in fact, you gotta bring them in when the nighttime temperatures get below 50 at night. You gotta bring these guys in. They are, they are tropical, uh, but I just love the colors. Uh, it just translates perfectly into the fall season. Pairing them with pumpkins, you know, as I mentioned, we've got our pumpkins in. So we've got these great carving pumpkins. We've got lots and lots of different sizes of gourds, mini pumpkins. Let's see, I think I grabbed a white one. Love the white pumpkins, they're just awesome. Really, really pretty. And so when I plant up a container, I love to pop in a little pumpkin to it as well. Uh, usually I'll put a little bit of straw, a little bit of pine straw, a little bit of wheat straw underneath it so it doesn't rot. And I can just kind of, if I'm looking for something of a filler kind of in my container, this is a great thing to kind of stick on top of your pot. You know, you put your soil in and then you just put a little bit of a riser there with some mulch, some pine straw, some wheat straw, and then just pop a pumpkin in there. You can use any different size of pumpkin for that. Uh, lots and lots of different gourds that have come in too. Look at this guy, those green and white stripes. Really cool. The blues, I love. These have become so popular, these kind of, kind of off green, grayish colored pumpkins. Really, really nice. And then let's see, I got, you know, kind of like these squash, these different types of gourds. Lots and lots of fun things out there. Um, that you can pair them with on a front porch. And then of course, hanging baskets. Hanging baskets are super easy. Now what I'll do here is, uh, uh, this is just kind of a little bit of a, a different design that I grabbed today. But you know your cocoa lined baskets, um, moss lined baskets, you know, those are really, really nice looking baskets. You can even take, if you had a nice looking, you know, white basket or even just a green plastic pot. Uh, typically you're not gonna find a lot of mums growing in hanging baskets. So if you don't find one, this is all you have to do. This is just a slip in. So basically, I'm just taking this six inch, just make sure it fits, pop it right in there, and then just bring your chain back up around it. Just make sure you don't rip up the plant real bad. And it's as simple as that. So just like that, we have a nice hanging basket. And you can do that with, like maybe you've got a petunia or a begonia, like a dragon wing begonia that's kind of fizzled on you. Uh, just take it, put the plant into the compost pile, clean out the pot. I usually just wash it with a little soap and water, and then I'll just pop in my mum. Of course, if you can plant it, it's gonna last a little bit longer. You got a little bit more soil capacity, but if you wanna just drop it in, that's a very easy thing to do. I love to do that with my cocoa liners. Uh, you know, it makes the cocoa liner last a little bit longer too. Um, you just pop it right in there. Of course, planting it is always better, but if you're looking for just this quick splash of color, and maybe you don't wanna go through the process of planting it, just slip it in, super, super easy. And you can do that in containers as well. You know, just pop it into a container. Some people won't even take it out of the plastic pot. I don't 100% recommend that because what happens a lot of times is the drain holes will get clogged up. So people might take these, put them in their landscape because they're gonna go maybe move them in the backyard or they're just using them as annual color and they'll just plant them directly in the plastic container. The problem is, is the drain holes will get clogged up. And so that means that typically uh, what's gonna happen is, is you're gonna get waterlogged plants. So you know I mentioned you can't overwater a mom. Well, you could in that circumstance for sure. So what sometimes I'll recommend is just take a slightly larger plastic pot, slip that in the ground, and then just drop this in there. That way you've got enough room for that soil to kind of get out of the way of the root system of your plant. So you can use them in your landscape, you can use them on the front porch, hanging baskets in containers, pair them with your favorite football team, uh, any of your sports teams out there. There's so many, so many different uses for them. Uh, window baskets is another good one. You know, if you got window baskets and some of your petunias or begonias or some of your, your fun uh, 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 summer annuals are starting to fizzle a little bit, then just pop them in there. Uh, what if you cut the bottom out? So, so Joe, that's a great point. If you want to, you can cut the bottom off. So you can cut the bottom right here at the bottom. You know, just use a little knife or something or just pop your plant out real quick. You can usually just take your mum out and put it off the side, cut out the bottom. But what we don't wanna do is block those drain holes on the bottom. So if you open it up a little bit, that will help Joe. That's a great option. And then maybe what I would do is when I dig my hole just to pop it into the ground, uh, then I will just kind of amend that soil underneath or at least rough it up a little bit so I know that I'm not putting it on a hard packed soil underneath because then that's basically gonna be the same as a bottom of a pot. Uh, so just loosen that up so the water has a chance to percolate down through it. Uh, but that's a great option. I, I love you know just taking a, a plastic pot that's slightly bigger, sinking it in the ground, and then I can just pop these in if I want to. Although, what I'll say typically is plant them. You can always dig them up and move them later. It's very, very easy to do. 
So you got lots of options there. Let me show you just some other fall plants that I love to pair with them. Um, is This is one of my favorites here. This is called a, a chorus. So this is Ogon a chorus. So it's this really pretty lime green. Love the lime greens. Looks great with maroon colors. Really has that great contrasting color. So actually acts as kind of a thriller, but also kind of somewhat of a spiller, depending on how you use it in a container. Uh, when I do my fall containers that you'll see coming up in the upcoming webinars, <coughs> you will see that sometimes I take a plant and I'll actually plant it in kind of a little sideways so that you get more of a spilling effect out of it rather than more of a thriller effect. But a chorus Ogon is one of my favorites. Love that one. This is a heuchera or a coral bells. So these are just some of my other favorite fall kind of plants. This is actually a perennial, comes back year after year. It's actually pretty much evergreen in this area, but I love those purple undertones of the leaves. And there's lots and lots of different colors of these. I think I grabbed another one. Yep, here's the chartreuse kind of lime green color. So you can see those, these pair well with uh, a lot of the grasses and mums. And as we get into the pansy season, these are great combos, uh, great planter uh, uh, companion plants in our planting combos. And then let's see, I grabbed a couple other ones. Celosia adds a little bit of that hot kind of intense color. This is actually called Celosia Intense. Um, so really kind of a lipstick kind of looking. Sometimes you'll get these in corals, you'll get them in lots of different colors, but these are really, really great little pairs, uh, especially if you're working with, you know, that GMU colors, the Go Dukes. You can do a little bit of purple, almost pinkish color, but with the yellow looks great. You can pair it with white. Looks great with the white. You know, throw in that heuchera, that Coral Bells heuchera, and you've got a great combination right there. Lots and lots of ornamental peppers. You know, really love this dark kind of black. This one's called, uh, uh, it just says ornamental pepper. I don't know if this one has a name on it. I can't remember the name, but it's just a little uh, red kind of pepper on it, but it's got this great black foliage to it. This really, really intense, dark, dark purple foliage, almost black. Really, really pretty with those red uh, peppers that almost look like berries on it. Really great combination. Again, if we're looking for kind of uh, a contrasting color, Pairs great with a bright yellow or a even white mum. Looks awesome. And then you can also get these peppers as well. Lots and lots of different types of ornamental peppers right now. There's reds, there's oranges, they're the little tiny ones, they're the bigger ones. There's lots and lots of options. This is a great little spiller out of a container for your fall kind of uh, container gardens. And let's see, one other one, right? There was one, oh, marigolds. So of course, marigolds are a great companion with mums. They look very, very similar. Now these, of course, are annuals. They're not gonna come back each year, but marigolds bloom really, really well in the spring and also really, really well throughout the summer and into the fall. So you can get a long bloom cycle with marigolds as well, and they just have that great fall color. This one's a mix of some yellows, some golds, and some oranges with a little bit of red in it. So really, really nice options for you. Lots and lots of choices. You can do a lot of different things with them. Let's see, did I write down anything else? Uh, oh, of course, if we're gonna plant them in the landscape, mass plant them. So, you know, whenever I talk about landscape design, I always talk about massing out plants, putting a big group of them together. You're gonna get much, much more impact than if you just plant one mum here and one over there. You're not gonna be able to see them as much. Get five, seven yellow mums. Plant them all together in the landscape. Give them a little bit of space to grow. Remember, they get about two to three feet wide. So if you space them two feet, they'll always you know, kind of grow into a big mass. If you plant them three feet, you'll kind of get this rolling kind of you know, hills of mums. It's a great way to really draw your eye in the landscape to a certain area. I, I re really, really recommend it with annuals. You know, instead of planting, you know, when we talk about pansies, I'll talk about this a lot. Instead of planting five pansies, try and push yourself to plant a little bit more. Uh, it really, really is gonna add a lot more impact to your landscape. It's really gonna draw your eye. It's just much more beneficial and you're gonna get a lot more enjoyment out of it than sitting there looking at it saying, man, I wish I had planted you know, twice as many or three times as many. Uh, you would have had so much more color uh, and a lot more enjoyment. So try that in your landscape the next time you're out there working in the yard, get a couple extras. Mums are very, very affordable. I mean, imagine getting a, let's see, let me just check on the price here before I say, a uh, $7.99 little perennial. It's a great perennial price, a plant that comes back year after year, great price. $7.99, usually $9.99 for the nine inch, uh, and then the price goes slightly up. So we're anywhere between $7.99 and $12.99 for a huge plant, 
Let's check the price on this guy. I think this one is $14.99. So $14.99, and you're not going to get any plant quite that size for $14.99. It's a great deal, um, and you can usually find some good deals on them throughout the fall season. So, you know, great deal, huge plant, and, uh, you know, for, you know, buy, you know, five of them, and we've spent under $100, and you're going to get, you're going to cover up you know, what, five times three, so you're gonna come up 15 square feet almost uh, with, with just, you know, some mums. They're very, very easy. They're great in the landscape, so it's a great use for them. Um, so definitely come in and check us out here at McDonald Garden Center. Lots and lots of uses for mums. They're very, very easy to grow. As much as I talked about all the different things that you can do with pruning, uh, if, if all you did was just feed them in the landscape, you're gonna love them. They're gonna come back for you. Very reliable plants. Very, very little insect and disease issues. Um, and they're just great in containers and they're so much fun. And they're just the sign of fall to me. They're a sign of football season, college is going back. Um, you know, all of those great things that happen in the fall. Family time to get together, Thanksgiving in the future. So fall is a great time to get out in your yard. Enjoy your moms. Come and see us here at McDonald Garden Center. I hope you all enjoy this. I don't think I see any other questions. I'll go back and check real quick. I think I got everybody's questions. Oh, Sharon said, how many hours of sun do they need each day? I didn't miss that. So about uh, at least five to six hours. So when I talk about full sun, I usually say at least five to six hours. And that's good sun. So if you're getting sun from nine to one, then that's not going to be quite enough uh, sun because that's that's early morning sun. You really want five to six hours of good bright sun. So full sun is going to be somewhere from 10 to 4. Um, maybe, I mean, you'll be fine with 12 to 6 too. So you want to, when you're planting them out in the yard, look for an area that's going to get at least five to six hours of full sun. That really, really helps. Good question. Let's see. Da -da. I think that answers all the questions. All right, so Diane, thank you for saying thank you. Um, I hope everybody has a great day. Enjoy this cool weather. I know in our neck of the woods here in the Hampton Roads area, we're gonna get a little bit of a, a chance of rain um, over the next couple days, uh, but then it's supposed to cool off. We're supposed to have a gorgeous weekend. So get out there, come and see us for Mum Mania this weekend. It's a great time to come in and get some great deals on all things Mum and just enjoy the weekend and get out in the yard. And we'll see you next week when we talk about our uh, best plants, house plants for low light conditions inside your home. Hope to see you next week. Everybody have a great week. Bye, everybody.